Hey, we're live. Welcome to Web Sluice YouTube Live. My name is Trisha Griffith, the very, 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 very proud owner of websluice.com, uh, the most incredible true crime discussion forum. I believe in the universe, and I believe it is because of the great work the members do. All, all over the world, they come to Web Sluice to discuss cases and have our moderators who make sure everybody behaves because once in a great while somebody might just oh i don't know say something a little snippy and we have to you know take care of it and yes of course i'm not quite prepared yet at least uh camera ready yet i have to do a, a few things but the good news is we have diane fanning diane fanning is truly an amazing true crime author now, she wrote this book that uh, I, 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 it, it is, she wrote, Diane Fanning wrote the book before the trial, I mean, before Casey Anthony was found not guilty. And we're going to talk to her about that. We're going to talk to her about all her other books because she has many. But first, I need to talk to you about something serious. This is for websluice.com. Uh, as you know, we uh, were hit uh, hard by the coronavirus. Our advertising plummeted. And so for the past couple of months, I have had to rely on your generosity and help to keep web sleuths from going dark. Uh, I, it's not my nature to keep asking for help with web sleuths. And, um, but we're, we're getting to a crunch time here where we have a lot of bills due and uh, I, I don't have the money to pay them. So if you've already donated, I, once is plenty. I don't expect anybody to donate twice or do anything like that. But if you can, uh, I'm going to put up a link to our PayPal page right here. You know, if half the people that, that have visited and came to Web Sluice, half of them donated $1, I wouldn't have to ask anybody again. So anyway, if you can, I would greatly appreciate it because we're we're in a, a real rough area right now. So thank you very, very much. Now, of course, I don't have any of my uh, pages up that I need up. Diane Fanning, welcome to Web Sleuths YouTube Live. Thank you for your patience, your kindness, and your willingness to come on and chat with us this afternoon. How are you? Uh, you're welcome, Tricia. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Now, you wrote the book, Mommy's Little Girl. But, Diane, that's not the only book you wrote. We have a list of books. But before we get into that, real quickly, tell me how you got to become this prolific, incredible true crime author. How did that happen? Well, there was a lot of serendipity that started back when I was... Um, just nine years old. I'd been out walking with a friend, and this, we lived in a neighborhood that was part house, rural and part suburban, so there'd be houses and then there'd be cows. Mm -hmm. And we were walking through one of the cow populated areas, and this car comes down a hill and stops and asks for directions. Okay. We, we offered him directions, and he was saying, I'm not really understanding what you're telling me. I don't know this area real well. Could you come over and look at my map? Oh. So oh. I walked over to look at his map, and he had opened his car door, and instead of a map, I saw he was exposing himself. <gasps> he grabbed hold of my upper arm and tried to pull me into the car. Oh, my God. I um, was trying to pull backwards, but I don't think I had much of a chance. When just then, another car came up over the hill and laid on his horn. The guy let go of me and took off with his car door still hanging open. Oh, thank God. Oh, my God. But I did a big fan of Dragnet repeats on daytime TV. Right. And I knew that what Sergeant Friday would want me to do is memorize that license plate number. So Absolutely. And I went home and told my mother, and she called the police. Mm -hmm. When they picked that man up, they found evidence in the trunk of his car that a month earlier, he had sexually assaulted and murdered an eight-year-old girl oh my God. in a, a nearby community. 
Oh, dear Jesus, you came so close. <gasps> yes, and when um, I was watching uh, 48 Hours, I saw Lily Crystal Searle, and she had been left for dead by Tommy Lynn Sells after he killed her friend. Mm -hmm, and right. she went out at 4 a.m. in the morning to get help from neighbors. Mm -hmm. And that Lily Crystal could not speak because her throat was slit. Oh. When she came out of surgery, she still couldn't speak because her vocal cords had to heal. But she wrote, uh, send the police. The police came. They brought a forensic artist. And within a couple of hours, they knew exactly who it was mm -hmm. who had committed that crime. And that little girl testified in the courtroom and ended a two-decade-long murder spree by Tommy Lynn Sells. She was my new hero. Right. I had to write about her story mm -hmm. and everything that led up to it. And it was just, it was I was driven. And I wrote a sample chapter, emailed it to an agent, and had an agent within 24 hours. Wow. And what year was this? This was back in 2001. Mm -hmm. um, it was just days before 9-11. Okay. And so this was your first book. I remember the case very, very well. And you're right. What a brave little girl. Do you have any updates yes. on her? I mean, she's an adult now. Um, how is she doing? Do you know? The latest I've heard is that she's doing very well. Mm -hmm. And... Um, She's moving forward with her life. The, the people around her are really protective about details because they don't want people. Good. Her. Right. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. That's that's good to know. Well, I'm glad that uh, that she's she's doing well. That would be such a horrific thing to overcome. And I'm glad yeah. to hear she has a lot of uh, people around her protecting her. But I remember that I, we all do. I think uh, it was so horrific, and she was. So brave, and what a monster that that I don't want to call him a and man. And it's just because of my experience, it really hit me hard. Right, you know, it was like I was always gasping hearing her story. I mean, she did what I did times one hundred. Right, you and, know, but, but, thousand. Right, but it was, wow, you know, it was just so overwhelming to me. Do you still have? I, I don't. I don't know if it, this would be the right. Uh, phrase, but post-traumatic stress syndrome, does it still wake you up at night and to realize how close you came to being uh, attacked and assaulted and murdered? You know, I think writing this book and telling Crystal's story really helped me get beyond it. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had issues before that, but this it was like I put it all to bed. Mm-hmm. It almost at times to me felt like this is why that happened to me mm -hmm. so that I could write about Christian. You know what? I understand what you mean. I think that's uh, I, I think that's a, that's a very right, correct feeling to have because uh, it certainly gives purpose to what happened to you even more so. And you were able to tell her story. What is the name of that book? I'm about ready to put up the link to your page, and, and people can see how many books you've written, and just on incredible topics. Yeah, that's Through the Window. It's called Through the Window. Okay. I'm going to yeah. put, uh, hold on, let me just grab that really quickly. And a, um, a highly professional YouTube creator would have all of this stuff ready, but of course, I'm, <laughs> I'm running around trying to feed the dogs, you know, and go, oh my God. Okay, uh, it's called Through the Window. Let's see here. Um, okay, yeah. there. If you go to the link I just sent you and click on uh, her uh, Diane Fanning's uh, True Crime, a drop box will come down, and wow, you will see all of the amazing, like I said, it's just, uh, I'm so impressed because writing true crime is difficult. It's not like you sit down and just, go on the internet and search. Tell us briefly what goes into writing a book. I mean, you have to travel. You have to talk to people that don't want to talk to you. It can get pretty messy. 
Yes, and and um, it, 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 it can get very messy, but you know, you usually, I mean, I start out with an internet search, of mm-hmm. course, right. you know, just and more to gather names than anything else, and, and to write a, uh, a chronology of the crime, mm-hmm. and um, then I, I have to talk to a lot of people, I go, I go to places where bodies were left, I go to places where the crimes occurred, uh, with the book through the window, since he had been killing for two decades, and there were 50 people he'd confessed to killing, mm-hmm. uh, there was no way I could get to all those places. But I did go to some, and I even spent afternoons in libraries going through microfish because there just wasn't the stuff online that there is today. Right. And um, so I, you know, I, I travel, I travel around quite a bit writing these books, and. Uh, I'm I'm more interested in the people that are connected to the case than I am in actually the crime itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, The crime itself is a sensationalistic part of it. But the people and how they got to the place where this horrible thing happened to them and um, what reaction their death had on the wider community and on the people closest to them. And... um, so I interview a, a lot of, of people that are just connected to the victim in one way or the other. Mm-hmm. I also interview people who are connected to the perpetrator. And I talk to, of course, you know, law enforcement and district attorneys and right. some private investigators. So I gather from as many different sources as I can as much information so I can tell the full story mm-hmm. as it happened. And again, that's not something that you just do in a month or so. I, it, sometimes it can take years, right? Uh, well, yeah, it can take a very long time. And it, a lot of it depends on how thing makes it for me. Like in Florida. What, what, oh, um, hey, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Diane, something happened to your phone. Did you just... Uh, dive into a swimming I, pool. My ear, ac- my ear accidentally hit it. Oh, okay, Sorry. okay, good. I thought maybe you were like swimming and went underwater. That's okay too. We'll we'll take care of that. We'll <laughs> we'll deal with that. Anyway, I'm sorry. Please continue. Um, the um, the, 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 the district attorneys can make my life very difficult, right? Uh, because they have lots of information. I'm probably the easiest one I had was a, a district attorney in uh, Florida who had this philosophy that once we've given information to the defense, we've given it to the enemy, so we might as well give it to everybody. Well, that's a good point. Uh, that, Very good point. That, that does make my life a lot easier. A lot of times I have to go through back doors to get information. One time I spent a whole month actually going to a defense attorney office mm-hmm. and going through his transcript of the trial. Wow. So, um, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, and then others, like there was a case in San Antonio where, again, I had a month. I had a room set off for me where I could go through all the evidence from the case. And by doing that, I was able to read the victim's personal um, journal. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was, gave me such insight to that woman and, and what she had been through in her personal struggles. And, Dan, what, ca- what, uh, what, I'm sorry, what case was that? That was um, the McFarlane case. Mm-hmm. And it was in the book Gone Forever. Okay. Gone Forever. And I really, yeah. And when you read someone's personal journals, man, you feel like you know that person. Exactly. I mean, I actually cried over the fact that I would never be able to meet her. Oh, dear. That, yeah, you do get clo- you do get close, uh, whether you you meet them in person or not. When you're reading somebody's journal and learning all about their life, I mean, they never had any idea that all of these details, personal details, would be coming out. And so, I, you have a great responsibility to make sure that those that no longer have a voice have a voice through you. And that's what yeah. I, I love about about your writing. You are passionate. And you take your time to make sure you get it right. So let me put the link up again, everybody. You can take a look at Diane's page and uh, her amazing books. We're talking with Diane Fanning.
true crime author extraordinaire and author of the book, Mommy's Little Girl. Now we're going to talk about this uh, for a little bit. This is about Casey Anthony. Now I know there's probably all one or two people that uh, were actually living, oh, I don't know, in Afghanistan in a hole and did not know about the Casey Anthony case. So for you that have been there, let me tell you, Casey Anthony's darling daughter, Kaylee, was missing for 30 days and Casey Anthony didn't do a damn thing about it. It was her mother, Cindy, that finally called the police. Uh, long story short, Kaylee's bones were found not very far away from Casey Anthony's home, her parents' home, George and Cindy. She was on trial for murder. She was found not guilty, and, and she was found not guilty of murder and of, was it child neglect or abandonment? What was the... I think it was not. She was found not guilty of child neglect, and um, there was another charge, too. I think it might have been abandoned. Right. And, and that's what baffled. Why couldn't the jury find that, find her guilty of at least that, you know? I, you know, I don't understand, because to me, Tricia, when I think about a little girl, if she had gone missing for an hour, I'd be calling the police and reporting it. But she went missing for 30 days, and in case she did nothing to find little Kaylee, like in an official manner, she didn't go to the police. And then after her mother went to the police, she took the police on a wild goose chase to places that, that were just made up in her head. She didn't try to help them. No. In fact, she we, didn't do anything for that little girl. No, she didn't. Because uh, I believe Casey Anthony is a sociopath, psychopath, whatever. But uh, we have, now we use this all the time when we're talking about people uh, who, who lie and they keep telling a lie and we can't figure out why. And we, we just say, you know, it's Casey Anthony walking down the hallway to her, uh, to her office at Universal Studios. She just kept going and going. And, and the cops knew she didn't work there. She claimed she did. She finally gets to the end. And I, I think she even put her hand on a, a doorknob. And then she said, I don't work here. And th that to me just screams what type of person she was, right? Yeah, she really, so I think she really believed that she Before the trial. Tell us why, yes. and tell us why that turned out to be a great thing. Well, I was able to give my honest opinion based on studying the scientific reports and documents, all the forensic evidence that had been gathered by law enforcement. I would had time to go through all of that and form what I feel is a very educated opinion about exactly what happened to Lily Cayley. Had I waited until the trial before I got my book out, she was found not guilty. Mm -hmm. I could not say any of those things that I said in my description of Kaylee's murder because she was found not guilty and it would have been liable. So I had to, I had, I caught a break by having a publisher who wanted the book out really quickly. And I was able to get all the information together and study all those reports. And 17 months before the trial, the book came out. Oh, it was a bit, we were so glad that book came out. Because uh, on Web Sleuths, this was uh, next to, John Monet was the first big case. And that um, that's why Web Sleuths was created, not by me, but by somebody else in 1997. The next big case was Lacey Peterson. But it was the Casey Anthony case that put Web Sleuths on the map because at that time, uh, not only was it huge, but we had decided to really uh, make our rules very, very tight. We put strict restrictions on what people could talk about. And that's why it was a, a, a big deal and it, it turned out to work out well. But your book coming out at that time really helped our members because we could discuss what you were saying where you know we didn't have this information. So let's let's talk about this case a little bit because like you and I were talking before the show, 
I feel like talking about Casey Anthony is like therapy because I still can't believe she's out there free. And it infuriates me to no end. But let's start at the end. What do you know about Casey Anthony now? And feel free to throw in a rumor or two. Well, there is a rumor that she has a full contract. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anything that proves that's accurate. And I would imagine if she has a full contract, she would have to have a ghostwriter. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, there's also been a lot of rumors flying around about films, but I know that early on, the people that looked to the possibility of doing a film mm -hmm. uh, really got so much backlash from the public right. that they dropped the whole idea. Yeah. So, I, you know, I have no idea if anything that has her cooperation will ever see the light of day. Yeah, people would be too angry that she would be profiting off her story. Retro, we lost her. Oh my goodness, what happened? Hold on, hold on. Let me get the technical crew in here. We have top notch engineers here, people. The best. We'll find out what happened here. I'll redial. Hello, Tricia. Hi, what happened? What did I do? I don't know. I don't think you did anything. I was talking away and suddenly my phone rang. <laughs> and I realized that I, I lost you. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, we were talking about the fact that this is like therapy and, uh, you know, nobody would touch anything because of the backlash that Casey Anthony would do, be it a book deal or a movie. Uh, but let's, and you've heard that perhaps she has a book deal. Even if she does, I can't imagine that it would go forward because nobody would buy it. There'd be such a backlash. Yeah, and I think the, and the, the theory is among uh, a lot of publishers and producers is not only would there be a backlash so that that wasn't a success, but it could impact other projects they had or other books they had. Right. And I think the reason is, is the family, Casey's family, had cataloged that little child's growing up. There were so many photographs of her, and they just flooded the internet mm -hmm. and online, and, I mean, you're on TV, and she was a cute, darling little child, mm -hmm. and it was hard for your heart not to go out to her. Right. I mean, too, you were a mother. It, it, it was very, very difficult. So... Tell us the process. You decided to write the book, and then where did? How did you start? I mean, this was like I said before, the trial, biggest, biggest story, true crime story in the U.S., maybe in the world. How did you start out? Why did you start out? And what was your first step? Well, you know, I was before the remains of little Kaylee was found, I found myself riveted to this case. Mm -hmm. I looked at that little girl, and I could remember back to when I had a little girl that age, and, and I know how sweet and innocent and lovely they are, and I, it just, uh, my heart was already broken, and I, I was drawn to it because of that. I, you know, it was my motherhood that really drew me to that case, and, mm -hmm. um, and yet, uh, I had never, never been involved in anything that had such high publicity right. all over the country. And it was an experience. I mean, I felt like I was caught up in some sort of whirlwind. I mean, I went down to Orlando a number of times. One time when I was down there, um, I, I tried to ask uh, Jose Baez a question. And this big guy that was standing beside him was apparently a bodyguard, and he slammed me back into a concrete wall. What? And said, "Yes." Yeah. And he said, "You're getting too close." And I'm going, "Holy cow!" And this, this deputy comes up to me and he said, "I saw that. If you want to press charges, I will be your witness." Oh, tell me you did, please, please. Well, I didn't because you know I'm trying to write this. Oh, book. that's I true. I don't want to be part of the. Story. Right. You know, it was like, oh, it was just, uh, 
it, it was like a feeding frenzy all the time when I was right. down there. Um, but what, can I just, can I just, I, may I just comment? You know, yes. I, what a wuss Jose Baez to have yes. a big, huge bodyguard, you know, and, and, and you're not, uh, you know, Xena, the, the warrior queen. You're not this, you know, tall seven foot Amazon woman carrying weapons. You're a sweet lady, uh, a nice lady, a gentle lady. And he slams you up against a brick and I'm wall. Like five, one. You're five one. I would have. I would have, I'm sorry, I would have taken my knee and right in the patootie. I, I would have. I, I wouldn't have been able to help myself. I, I'm proud of you for not uh, for not returning a um, a push, if you will. So I, 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 to me, that just, ew, what an arrogant ass. That's, that's, Jose, that's a perfect yeah. story for Jose Baez. That's who he is. And I'm sorry. So please yeah. continue. So you tried to ask him a question, and then, and then what happened after the incident? Well, you know, then, um, I mean, he was surrounded by other people, and there was nowhere else to get close to him. And, but I just kept going to all the people, talking to anyone who would talk to me. And, um, and when I, you know, I couldn't talk to uh, Cindy, but I did go through procedure to request photos from her and I was told that no I could not have any of her photos unless I was willing to pay I, mean, I couldn't have an interview or any photos unless I was willing to pay and you know you just can't pay for somebody's story no mm -mm. because you know there's if the fact of the matter is is yeah you can buy a story but the truth is never for sale uh, I just, um, reading here in our chat, uh, one of our chatters, Granny Sue, said, anyone else have Casey fight with you in Twitter? She did with me. Uh, it was surreal, but kind of fun. Yeah. Can't you see Casey Anthony jumping on and trying to defend herself on social media somewhere with a stranger? Because oh, she's so sure. arrogant. She is so arrogant, you know? Yeah, I heard she did that to a number of people. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's... She probably wouldn't be doing it if she were where she belongs in prison, but um, that that increased her arrogance tenfold, I'm sure, because she got away with it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so let's talk about your theory. We're talking with Diane Fanning. Uh, Diane wrote the book, Mommy's Little Girl, about Casey Anthony. Uh, it was published uh, well over a year before the trial. And uh, Web Sleuth members were so grateful because it's like, yes, new information. And Florida does have the Sunshine Law, where at some point we do get all the evidence presented in a case. But you had a theory. And like you said a moment ago, you could only present this theory before the trial because she was found not guilty. You would have been open to libel if you had done this after the trial. What was your theory on what happened to Kaylee Anthony? I think she made um, chloroform in her parents' kitchen. It's a rather easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I think she put little Kaylee to sleep. And then she suffocated her and rode up the street and disposed of her body like a piece of trash. Mm -hmm. Put her in the trunk. I think she was... She was, uh, there were two things driving her. One, Haley was finally getting to an age yes. where she would actually be able to tell people about what she experienced, yes. what she saw of uh, Casey doing. There were rumors, and there were never more than rumors, right. that there were times that Casey put Kaylee in the trunk of her car right. uh, so she could party. We don't know that that's true, but if it was, Kaylee was at the age where she could tell people about it and it's... tell about her mother's lifestyle. And, mm -hmm. and on top of that, she knew that if she didn't want to take care of her child anymore and the child was still alive, that her mother would get it. And she'd never hear the end of it when her mother had to step in and raise her child. Oh, I can, yeah, you can imagine. We all have um, experienced Cindy Anthony, and she has suffered a horrible loss. 
And I, 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 my heart breaks for her because I have no doubt, and I'm sure you feel the same way, Diane, that she loved little Kaylee and would have done any, oh, as yeah. did George, as did George, that she, yeah. that little yeah. girl was the apple of their eye. But she created Casey. What did you find out, if anything, about Cindy Anthony? What was your impression? Cindy made a lot of mistakes in her life, and um, some of it was being too gentle with Casey mm -hmm. and too believing of Casey's lies. Right. She never held her accountable for anything she did. She always was ready to make excuses for her. She was always ready to perpetuate Casey's Mm -hmm. um, and she did, did so at, at a cost to her parents, at a cost to everyone around her. It was, it was bad parenting, which doesn't automatically produce a little monster. No, no. But in this case, it did. Mm -hmm. and, and it Casey, in my view, was a malignant narcissist. Perfect. Absolutely. She, she uh, exhibits all of those behaviors. And, and as I tell uh, the people that watch my YouTube channel, I am a uh, trained psychiatrist in my own mind. And I came to that same conclusion. <laughs> She's definitely a malignant narcissist. Uh, I throw out the word psychopath, but malignant narcissist fits it perfectly. I, I always think of the story of Cindy and George and uh, Lee and Casey at a wedding. And Casey was seven months pregnant, tiny little yeah. thing. Looked like she'd swallowed a basketball. Everybody kept saying, oh, Casey's pregnant. Oh, no, she's not. No, no, K Casey's, Casey would tell me she's not pregnant. It's like, are you kidding me? That's delusional. Yeah, it's a tumor. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right, it was a tumor. That's right, it was, yeah. Tumors are, exact, are shaped like a basketball, and they, they expel themselves in nine months in the form of a baby. I mean, come on. And you're right. And I think poor George was stuck between these two, I mean, I'm sorry, crazy yeah, women. I, I, think, I think that, that Cindy, honestly, um, was in so much denial after Kaylee was murdered that she um she I mean she behaved like an ass at times mm -hmm. and was protective when she shouldn't have been. Right. But you know what? And she has walked in her shoes. I mean really. You know, this is her child. I she, know. She's her child no matter what a pile of crap she might be. Mm -hmm. She is your child. Right. And poor George, uh, you know, I think a lot of times he just compartmentalized it. He knew that there were things wrong with the relationship between Cindy and Casey and it was causing problems. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't, I think he just wanted to leave that to the women folk. You know, I mean, he just didn't want to look at it. Right. And it ended up, you know, and when he did look at it, he was, he was suicidal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he literally was suicidal. Yeah, and yeah. The, 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 the poor man. Uh, I, I have a, a real quick Cindy Anthony story, and I apologize if people have heard this before. Uh, but, Diane, this was interesting. Um, I had somebody email me and offer me Cindy Anthony's uh, password to her email account. And I said, no, thank you. And I, I got in touch with Cindy Anthony. And I said, here's this person's email. They have hacked into your uh, email account and is offering me your password. And I said, uh, you know, if you tell me if you need to bring charges, if I can help, whatever. Because I, I was so disgusted by that. And um, mm -hmm. she was very cordial, but she told me something so delusional. She said that she was working with her lawyer to sue everybody on the internet that called Casey bad names and to shut down all of those sites. And when she told me that, and, and she said, I've never heard of Web Sleuths. Well, later we found out there were reams and reams of, uh, of uh, copies that she had printed out of, of what Web Sleuths people were saying on our forum. So she obviously mm -hmm. followed it very closely. But when I, I said, Cindy, I said, if a lawyer is taking your money and telling you that she or he can do that, 
they're stealing from you. I said, that's impossible. I said, I want to assure you on Websus, we do not allow anybody to call Casey, you know, the names that I've been reading, you know, slut and bitch. And I said, we don't allow it. I said, but you can't shut down the First Amendment. And I said, it, you will not win. And I said, and you will lose all your money, every bit of it. Oh, no, no, no. We're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to shut everything down. So I'm, I'm just, and I'm totally paraphrasing here because it was so long ago. Basically, she said, you know, I'm just warning you. So, you know, watch out. I think she really believed that, Diane. I really think she, Cindy Anthony believed she could shut down the internet and especially those sites that were calling Casey bad names. Crazy. She either believed that or she was deliberately trying to intimidate you. Yeah, well, that it just made me laugh. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah. Huh? Yeah. 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 Go, go right ahead. Uh, we do have a question from our chat room, and let me get it right here. It's from Leanne, one of our longtime members. And Leanne says, I'd like to hear Diane's opinion about long-term ramifications of Casey Anthony's acquittal with prosecution of child abuse and domestic homicide cases. Did that put a damper on what prosecutors have done since then when it comes to cases of child homicide and abuse? Um, I, I think that it taught a lesson in how you can have what you think is the perfect slam dunk case and be outmaneuvered by an unethical defense attorney. So I think that, um, I don't think it put a damper on it, but I think it made them want to have more mm -hmm. information before they proceed. And I guess in a way that is a damper. I just delayed is often just denied. Exactly. But um, I am hoping that the overall big picture ramification is that other prosecutors faced with similar circumstances have learned from that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and to me, what the experience was was you can have all the scientific evidence you want. Mm hmm. If you don't have an eyewitness or a freaking video, a, a defense attorney has an opportunity to tear the whole thing down by telling lies, making stuff up, and not proving it. Ex that jury took the word, every word of Jose Baez as if it was testimony. Opening argument and closing arguments are not testimony and they are not evidence. And lawyers are not supposed to say things in the, in the opening statement that they cannot prove during the course of the trial. Mm -hmm. But Jose Baez did that. It yeah. was very unethical. And, and I'm going to get to one of our uh, chatters, Kim. I'm going to get to your question here in just a moment. But tell us what you think, what you believe Jose Baez did that was unethical. I think he's just an unethical human being. And, uh, well, so. you know, he threw George under the bus yes. without any proof that George did anything. Mm -hmm. But he made it sound in his opening statement as if he was going to prove that. This is what happened. George Anthony killed that baby. And sexually and abused. And exposed to that baby. And, excess, and, and sexually abused. abused that baby. Right. And his daughter. His daughter, yeah. right. I mean, it was, there was no proof there. Mm -hmm. there. There was nothing to hold it to stand up to that and yet he went ahead and smeared that man from one end of the planet to the other and uh, and this gullible jury bought it yes she, and that was I, I would um, I would think you would have uh, I don't know some sort of, of fine or, or some sort of court action if a t an attorney gets up there and lies like that. I, I mean, that's, it, it's one thing to defend your client. It's a whole other thing to create a monster out of a grandfather yeah. with no proof. A and I guess you can do that. I guess that's legal. I, uh, I was amazed that no one brought him up on charges to the bar. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 
I just think it's I think it's wrong what he did. I think it's unethical. I think that when you listen to what some of the jurors said after the trial was that he instilled reasonable doubt regarding George Anthony. Mm -hmm. And I know he didn't. He just rambled on in an opening statement, in a closing statement about George. He didn't offer any proof for reasonable doubt. And, you know, I'll tell you what, there were jurors that said, well, I really thought she did it, but I didn't think the state proved their case. Number one, if you read those scientific documents, which none of you asked to see Mm -hmm. in the deliberation room, if you read those, you might have seen the proof. And secondly, if you really believe she did it, why didn't you hang the jury? At least. At, At least, least, yeah. Hang the jury. And, what, and tell us about the scientific evidence uh, for those of us with bad memories. Oh, Diane, are you there? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Diane, I still have you on speaker, but I can't hear you. Did you mute yourself by chance? Diane? My ear accidentally <laughs> chose. Touch the I know it. I do that all I'm the time. Sorry. That's okay. So, uh, um, God, you know what? I asked a question 1.2 seconds ago, and, and I, I've totally... Uh, oh, the scientific yes, evidence. Yes, thank you. Yes. There was scientific evidence in that vehicle that scientists were able to work out uh, between the chloroform in the car and other things. They had scientists from the body farm in Tennessee. That's right. These people know everything about decomposition, and mm-hmm. they brought that evidence into that courtroom. And maybe it was difficult for some lay people to understand what they were saying, but if they if they had, then they had an obligation to request those reports to look over them in the deliberation room. Mm-hmm. And they didn't. They didn't ask for any of that stuff. No, they didn't. And to me, that it was like all they wanted to do was get out of there. Well, I'm sorry. That is not fulfilling your duty as a juror. That is not holding justice up as something to be achieved. Mm-hmm. I was right. very disgusted with that jury. Um, oh my gosh, hold on. Um, I can't, is it uh, Oaklancia Lean? We're going to... Uh, Veer away from Casey Anthony here for just a moment. And um, Oglancia Lean put a heart up and it said, your book, Through the Window, you mentioned my family member who was killed by Tommy Lynn Sells, Bobby Wolford. Um, can you tell us about that? Do you know? Yeah, um, Bobby Wolford was, Bobby Lynn Wolford. She was um, a sweet, a sweet girl. Um, she just made one mistake, and that was she went with some people that she, her mother didn't trust, some friends of hers, mm-hmm. and told her mother she was going with someone else who was responsible. Oh, no. And those people she went with dumped her off at a convenience store in the middle of the night, <gasps> and by really bad misfortune, who else was there? Oh. Tommy Lindell. Oh, my God. And he sweet-talked her and said he'd give her a ride. She was crying because she was going to have to call her mom, tell her mom the truth, and she knew her mom was going to be mad. Mm-hmm. So he said, oh, come on, I'll just give you a ride home. Uh. Well, little Bobby didn't make it home. She was assaulted with a object, sexually assaulted with an object. She was murdered, strangled to death. And her body was left in the woods where it wasn't found for months. A bunch of hunters found it later. And can you imagine the agony of her mother for months not knowing what happened to her little daughter? I cannot. You know, yeah, she probably did something she shouldn't have done. She lied to her mom. We, but she said it's not a death penalty offense. Yeah. We did I that mean, all the time. Everybody's told at least a little white lie to their mother at one point well, or another. You have to, or else they'll freak out if they know the truth of what you're doing, and you think you know, you think you can handle it, you know, and you can't. Yeah, you're too young. Yeah. So, oh my God. Well, I am so so sorry 
uh, Oak Lancy Lean about uh, uh, about your family member Bobby. I really that is just heartbreaking. And uh, how many people do we know that cells killed? Oh, the, the law enforcement has confirmed just over twenty. Oh he confessed to fifty, and he told me that that was about seventy percent. Oh my God! Okay. We're, like I said, we're going to put Casey Anthony on the back stove here because now we're talking about uh, about your book. Hold on one second. Let me just get back up here to the uh, to the question. Uh, we're talking about your book through the window uh, about Tommy Lynn Sells, uh, the serial killer. And this you actually interviewed him. Uh, tell us what that was like. Well, you know, the first time, the first couple of times, it was really kind of stupid. Because, you know, I told him up front. I sent him a letter. I told him what I was doing. So he knew I was writing a book. So the first thing we talked, all he wanted to do was ask me for money. And then the next thing he wanted to do was sex talk, which I wouldn't do that either. Oh, my God. So I only God. got down to business. And it was, it was so strange, Tricia, because... Uh, I would ask him about different things, and 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 he would tell me stuff. But all almost every story he told me was so choppy, and I'd get it over a couple of interviews, mm -hmm. you know, to put the pieces together. And there were times when all he wanted to do was tell me funny stories, and you know, and and he would make me laugh, and mm -hmm. I'd come out of there feeling like something's wrong with me that I'm laughing at this man, but, right? Uh, but uh, then other times he would try to uh, really distress me and give me really graphic details of mm -hmm. some of the crimes he committed. Oh. And, and it was distressing. Um, but, uh, you know, I stuck with it and tried not to let my feelings show. Mm -hmm. The one time I really did, I couldn't help myself, was when he told me about his life at the little trial. And how his mother had abandoned him with her aunt. And then when, four years later, she comes back to take him, uh, they, she won't let him see them anymore. And that family was his family. I mean, he was 18 months when he was sent to live with them. Oh, wow. And he was school age when she took him. I mean, this was the only family he remembered. Right. And she took him away. And then, when she got tired of him, she turned him over to a pedophile to let him live with a pedophile. Oh, dear God. And I thought, my God, this is so horrible. How could a mother do this? So I called his mother, and I asked her about these things. I said, this is what Tommy told me. Tell me if anything he said is not true. Mm -hmm. And you know what she said to me? She said, well, a lot of people have had a lot of work, and they don't turn out to go killing people. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. and I go, well, no wonder he's a psychopath. Yeah. What a whore. His mother was a horrid beast. And again, as cliche -ish as this is, that's what happens a lot of time when you look at these violent criminals. It, you know, and we're not talking about not enough hugs during childhood. We're talking about something horrific. And this is one of my soapbox yeah. issues, Diane, is we've got to stop creating these monsters. And that woman uh, should never have been allowed to, um, uh, you know, have had a child and raised a child. I mean, my God. And I don't know. I, Diane, I have no idea how to fix this problem. But that is, that's it right there. That's it. In her mind, hey, other kids have had it worse and they didn't turn out that bad. What a piece of crap. But, you know. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes people come through, a lot of times. Right. People come through the most horrific oh, experiences sure. in childhood. And they turn out decent, productive human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got struggles in their life that they shouldn't have, but they, they, they rise above them. Right. And then other times you find people who have these storied childhood and somehow they turn into monsters too. So it, it, it's, it's weird. easy to blame the parents. Yeah. You can't always just blame the parents. Well, you can't because there, there comes a point as a human being where you have to take responsibility for your for your actions uh but again i i envision a day when we will be able to correct a brain that is that has these deviant horrible impulses 
and uh, not not turn them into a Stepford wife, but make them so they can be normal. I think that is on the horizon, thank goodness. But uh, I hope so. Yeah. I hope you were right. So is uh, because you know it's like cells. If she had never taken him away from his aunt, mm -hmm. I, I have these feelings that he would have just he he wouldn't have had memories of her, and and he would have just turned into you know a, a good old boy going right. out fixing cars. And a lot and, girl, and a lot of people would be alive today. Yes. Yes. And I, I just, uh, I, I just don't understand why there isn't an answer for this. I don't know. When, when you were talking with cells, did and, yeah. and, and this is this is um, this is delicate. But did he give you any indication why he started doing this? Was it all sexual? Was it anger? Was it a combination of everything? Yeah, I'll tell you, with him, it, I mean, he killed men, women, and children, so it wasn't particularly sexual. Mm -hmm. um, it was, but every time he went out and intentionally committed murder, it was after he had a fight with his mother or his wife. Uh, so it was, it was like transferring his anger. Mm -hmm. And but the first person he killed, and this has happened a lot of cases first person he killed it was he didn't intend to kill them mm -hmm. he got he was in a fight and he had he was armed with a knife but the other guy had a knife and you know and and he killed the guy mm -hmm. well you know what we can kind of all understand how that could happen and you can also understand how someone who did that could go on to live a good life right but someone like Sells was warped enough that he got pleasure out of the feeling of power he got from killing that human being. And he said that he liked strangling people best, even though he, he killed kill people all sorts of ways. His favorite was strangling because he can look them in the eye as they as the life fled from their body. Oh dear God. Yeah. Oh, well, that comes from being uh, handed over to a pedophile and, you know, having no control. And, uh, oh, dear Lord. Now, it, he's dead, right? Sales? Yes, he was executed, I think, I think it was 2015, mm -hmm. something like that. Good, good. Yeah, yeah that's one monster this society uh, does not and need. I, I was in contact with him up till... Um, been, uh, about a year and a half before he was executed and he, he cut off contact because he said his spiritual advisors told him that I was not good for him. Well, his spiritual advisors were too Satanist. <laughs> so I guess I get a badge for that. Good for you. I'm glad you weren't uh, I'm glad you weren't good for him. <laughs> How did that make you feel knowing that you were talking to a dead man walking basically? Did that bother you at all or well, you know, it didn't even bother me. It didn't bother me until after he was executed. Mm -hmm. And then it really sunk in. And, you know, um, when you look at the death certificate for somebody who's executed, it says homicide, which kind of gives you the will. Yeah, you know? that, that is. I've so, always. That, that's the, But that's what it is, you know. And it's weird, though. It's yeah, weird, yeah. It's weird, yeah. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just like, it just was weird. To have known someone who was murdered by, um, legally by the state. Right. You know, it's like they were ordered to murder him. And it, and it just, I spent time with this man. And, mm -hmm. it, and I felt so badly for the little boy that he was. And at the same time, I was fully aware that he made adult decisions to kill. Right. He was no longer that little boy, right. and so he was responsible for that. And if anybody deserved the death penalty, it was him. But it was still so bizarre I bet. to have been that close to someone, to have that person call me a friend. Yeah, and then to find out they were legally murdered, although deserved. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you're relieved as, as much as, as we all are that this monster is no longer on this planet. Uh, Sells was married. Did you ever talk to his wife? Did he have children? Please tell me he didn't have children. 
Um, yes, he had children. Um, he, there were a couple of women he had children with before he got married. Then he did marry this woman who already had a couple of children out in, in uh, West Texas, uh, in Del Rio. Mm-hmm. But he, when he married her, he had, I, I forgot about this woman. There was this other woman. The first woman he married was a guy, he knew this guy in prison, this nurse who had killed two people. And this guy in prison told him that his sister was mentally disabled. And um, if he made nice to her, he might be able to get some of her social security money. Mm-hmm. So he did. He was in prison in West Virginia, and he married this woman and took advantage of her financially and dumped her here, there, and everywhere. She ended up living with his mother. And then he went out to Del Rio, and he married this other woman who had two children, mm-hmm. who, uh, when she filed for divorce, I found out that she didn't need to file the divorce for divorce because he was already married to somebody else, so that her marriage wasn't legal. Right. And yeah, so so he didn't have children with either of the women he married, but he did have a couple before that. Yeah, and I, I guess we don't know what happened to them. Hopefully, they don't have any didn't have anything to do with their dad. But I don't know. It scares me. To I ha- I've heard from one of them. Mm-hmm. But they sure don't want anybody to know her. She doesn't want anyone to know her name. Good. They just want to know where she is, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I um, don't blame her. Yeah, yeah. Very, very scary. Very sad. And, and doesn't all of this, you've written so many books. In fact, hold on. Just on your website alone, there's one, two, three, four. I'm going to read them out here. Death on a River, Written in Blood, that was in the UK. Bitter Remains, Under the Cover of Night. Sleep My Darlings, Her Deadly Web, hold on, Mommy's Little Girl, A Poison Passion, The Pastor's Wife, Out There, Under the Knife, Baby Be Mine, Gone Forever, Written in Blood, Into the Water, and Through the Window, the one that we're talking about, uh, the serial killer cells. All that crime, all that heartache. And plus I've written fiction. Oh, fiction. Oh, other books, Exactly. Uh, let's see, Lucinda's Place, Detective Series, uh, Secret City Series, Molly Mullet Mystery, Anthology, uh, Red Boots and Attitude, Her Texas, Reflections on Smith, Mountain Lake Anthology. Uh, when do you have time to eat? <laughs> I mean, my God. Oh, I do very good in the eating department. <laughs> I, I wish I didn't do so well. But, um, yeah, it's very, uh, you know, I have, I wrote to say, I started writing fiction mm-hmm. because I was kind of, I got tired of looking at crime scene photos right. and autopsy reports and stuff. And so I, I wanted to write fiction and that way I could kill whoever I wanted. Oh, good idea. Oh, you could get out yeah. your frustrations. That's good. I, just real briefly, <laughs> writing all of those crime novels and having to look at pictures and talk to victims and talk to people who have lost loved ones and sick people like cells, didn't that just get to you at some point. Obviously it did because yeah. you started writing fiction. So tell us about that. Yeah. So yeah, it's um well, you know, I mean I'm I'm like I, I probably got more him empathy than is good for me. Mm-hmm. Because I, I just cry for some of the victims you know, a lot. I, I just can't help it. It's so horrible. I mean the victims family members, it's so horrible what happened to them. You know mm-hmm. that, uh, it's bad enough to lose a loved one, but then to lose a loved one in that horrible, horrible way, because somebody chose to steal their life, it, it's dreadful. Mm-hmm. And and then there's people like Jules Ray, who um, I believe Sells killed her son, but she was found guilty of murdering her 10-year-old son. What? And, she, you know, yeah, and she got a 65-year sentence. And Sells confessed to me about that murder, and I put that in my book. And ultimately, that led to her getting a new trial and being acquitted. Oh, my God, how awful. How terrible. Yes, can you imagine? No. Being a mother loses her child to murder and then is accused of committing that murder. I, I can't think of anything worse to happen to a mother. Well, I, real briefly, if you can't, how the hell did that happen? 
Well, it, it started, I mean, what Sal said happened is that she was rude to him at a convenience store. Now, knowing Sal, I know it's probably that he said something off-color to her, mm -hmm. and she just ignored him. And that's probably his definition of, of being rude. He ignored and, him. Yeah, she ignored him. Right. And he, he killed her child, he said, because he didn't want the boy to grow up to be just like his mother. So, um, <sighs> she was, um, I mean, she did some stupid things afterwards, like she didn't see... All she saw was the blood in her son's bedroom and the man in the hall. Mm -hmm. She did not see that her son was on the floor by the bed. And she just saw this man running through her house. And she thought that he had abducted, and maybe with another person had abducted her son. So that's her first conclusion. My son's been taken. Right. And so she's running out looking for him. Uh -huh. And that, some people didn't think that was normal. But then her ex-husband a cop said that, you know, she did this. I'm certain she did this. And oh he my made God. up all sorts of stuff. Right. So she got really screwed by her ex. And on top of that, she was a graduate student at the university. She didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. Her parents were retired missionaries. Lord knows they didn't make any money. No, right. And, and so she had to have a court assigned attorney and she got someone who by his own admission was out of his element. He did not know what he was doing. He did not know what questions to ask. And, you know, he should have, he'd never done a murder case. He should have never been assigned to handle that case. That is so horrible. Was. How long was and she, they, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. She was sentenced to 65 years. She was only in jail for a few months before um, they managed to get her out on bail, but it was enough time for her to be seriously abused by her fellow inmates. She had her head smashed against the wall repeatedly, and she 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 had serious PTSD from that experience. Oh, I don't blame her. I apologize. I had to take a little bit of candy. I uh, have um, diabetes, and I was feeling a little. A little light in the head. So I just had to eat a little something here. I apologize. I normally don't eat while I'm doing an interview. Um, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, Kim in our chat room wants to know, when you set out to do a book, how long does it usually take you? Uh, let's talk about a true crime book. It involves a lot of research. How long does that usually take? Well, um, it, I have done it in as short as five months. Mm -hmm. What's um, the longest? But uh, two years. Okay. And, and some of it, when I'm doing it really fast, um, I don't really have a life, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I say, hey, what's his name to my husband? You know, it's like, you know, I, I just totally am in the world of that book. And right. And that's about all I'm doing when I'm doing it fast. Understood. Well, yeah, and it does take a lot of work and you're immersed in it the whole time. Yeah. Uh, Diane Fanning, you have been so gracious to give us all this time. I'm going to keep you just a little while longer because I want to go back to Casey Anthony real quickly here. Yeah. And you wrote the book, Mommy's Little Girl. Uh, mm -hmm. It came out before Casey Anthony was found not guilty. And so therefore you were able yeah. to put out your theory as to how she killed Kaylee, which is pretty much what um, the majority of people think that she chloroformed her and smothered her and, put her in the trunk of her car and, and, uh, and dumped her body. And the reason for the killing was Kaylee was getting old enough to talk. She was getting old enough to say there was no Zanny the nanny. She was getting old enough to say that mommy puts me in the trunk. You know, I mean, all kinds of wild stuff. So we can see that happening. Can you tell us uh, maybe things in there that you found that surprised you or perhaps something in your book or in your research that you feel people didn't know that you, you found out. So just, a, 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 I guess, a broad statement. What did you find that made you just go, wow, that's nuts? Well, you know, there was a lot that wasn't out in the media that came out in trial. Mm -hmm. But at trial, nothing came out that wasn't in my book, which that really surprised me. 
mm-hmm. more than anything, was that the, the whole case the state presented was pretty much how I presented it in the book, mm-hmm. you know, more than a year and a half before. And um, that, that was surprising to me. It was also, when I was doing the research, finding out how much Casey had lied to her parents, mm-hmm. how much she had taken advantage of her grandparents, and how she'd gotten away with everything. You know, I know sometimes it's really difficult to raise kids. Yes. You know, particularly when they get to be teenagers, they, you know, they learn to lie so well. But mm-hmm. nonetheless, um, I was baffled by the acceptance of her lies. That did baffle me more than anything else. Well, she was so used to getting away with it. Yeah, yeah. and that's what I'm saying. I yeah. can't believe that that the people around her allowed her to get away with that. I know. It was crazy. It was just absolutely crazy. So, okay, Diane Fanning, what is next in your life? Is it a book? Is it a fiction? Is it true crime? Is it a vacation? What are you doing? Well, I am putting the finishing touches on um, a novel, I expect to have it out of my hands by the end of this month. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also have a project that I've been working on off and on for a little while, and it is about an innkeeper. And it, it's a true crime, but I may have to write a fictional book because it's really, really hard getting enough facts from the 1830s and 1840s. Oh, but it may true. have been the first serial killer in the United States. Oh, now that sounds really interesting. Well, we'll, we will look forward to that. And what I'm going to do in the description is I will put up your uh, your Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And of course, the link to your uh, page with all of your books. And there are many. Diane Fanning, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for writing the book about Casey Anthony, because, boy, you really, really saved us on Webster's Mommy's Little Girl. Thank you, Diane. And if there's anything ever we can do for you, Web Sluice is here. Just give me a buzz, okay? Okay, Tricia. It's been nice talking to you. Thank you. And I'll send you a link to the interview, okay? Okay, great. Take Thank care you. now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. What an amazing lady. Wow. Can you imagine the things she has heard and had to live with? And, ugh, oh, crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, I just want to thank, we had a lot of people uh, giving donations, and I just want to uh, personally thank them. Uh, Julie Krenicki, thank you. You are incredibly generous. She says, we love you and so grounded and humbling. Well, thank you. Um, I just most of the time feel mortified at myself. So I guess if, it's, if that's humbling, thank you. Uh, Bama Sunshine, hi, Miss Trisha. Thank you for all your hard work. Well, hey. You guys do a lot of the work, too, in chat, making sure that I'm on my toes and asking great questions. Thank you, Bama Sunshine, for your donation. And uh, let's see. Uh, Is it Juji? Amazing channel. Love your style, and your members are amazingly friendly. Friendly. Yes, they are. Thank you for the British Sterling donation, my dear. I do greatly appreciate it. And Jody35, thank you. Jody35, a, a big supporter of this channel. You're the best. And then Julie Krenicki again uh, saying, love Dr. Moskowitz, M-D, F-A-C-S-A-B-U-A-A-G-U, Mensa. Yeah, the, the, her husband is brilliant, as is Julie. She needs to give herself credit as well. Angie Hart, $100. Now, Angie said, during the chat, you know, don't don't give me too much credit because it's uh, it's Swedish dollars, but it's a hundred to you, Angie, and that's a lot. And it is the fact that you donate uh, when you can that I greatly appreciate. So that is one hundred to you, and that, like I said, that's a ton of money. So thank you, Angie. Don't don't. Uh, don't think we're, we're thanking you too much because we're not. I'm not. Thank you. And let's see here. Did I miss anybody? I think I did. Hold on. I think we had one more here. Did we? 
Yes, we did. I know we did. Ah, here it is. Granny Sue. Thank you, Granny Sue. I do appreciate it. You are a sweetheart. And uh, Oak Lancy, uh, I guess it's Layen. I am so sorry that uh, Cells murdered a family member, mur murdered Bobby. I am so, so, so sorry. Uh, glad you came to chat. I hope you will continue to come to the YouTube channel. Little Texan WS, thank you. Oh, tell your kids thank you so much. You are very, very kind. Hi, Arwen Hardy. How are you? Good to see you. And anyway, thank you, Little Texan. Very, very kind. And uh, I'll let, uh, I'll send a link to Diane so she can read all the comments in chat. But like I said, talking about Casey Anthony is like therapy because I get so angry thinking about her and thinking about Cindy Anthony and her delusions makes me crazy. Also, somebody wrote a very nice comment. Um, yeah, very complimentary, but mentioned, and I agree that the touching of my hair like drives them crazy. And I don't blame them because it drives me crazy. So I'm sorry. I just, oh, I'm going to stop. After this, the last time I'm touching my hair for a minute or two, I do apologize. It just, it gets in my face. And then I put a bread in and I don't like the way it makes my face look. And then I obsess about it. And then I start to like drool a little bit out here. It, it, it's just, it's too much. I do apologize for that. So I just need to put this back. Like I said, I really just want to shave my head. I swear to gosh darn. That's what we say in Utah. Gosh darn. Ah, just think how easy that would be. Have a big, fat, shaved head. That's the only thing is, though. My head is not like nice and round and, and pretty. It's like a it's like a, a big thing of dough. And it's got like bumps and lumps and it's sideways and kind of kind of weird oh oh clancy sorry <laughs> thank you oh clancy thank you i hope you'll come and join us again now we do a show just to remind everybody we do a show monday or actually seven days a week 10 p.m eastern however tonight i am taking the night off and then i'll be back tomorrow night also starting again on monday and monday through friday at 2 p.m eastern i will be doing what is supposed to be a 10 minute update of the uh, latest in true crime on web sleuths. Uh, I tried an experiment yesterday and it was a blast. It was fun. We had over 240 people in chat. It was crazy. And so we're going to plan on doing that every day at 2 PM Eastern. And then the big long show at night, 10 PM Eastern. Okay. There was something else I needed to tell you. What was it? <laughs> Thank you, Aaron Hardy. Thank you. Cosmic Muffin, hi. <laughs> Sensible Crime says, the only thing I constantly failed in grade school was keeps objects and hands away from her face. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, is somebody hitting the thumbs down button? What a weenie. Yeah, it's going to make me cry. <laughs> you guys crack me up. Oh, thank you, Arwen Hardy. Thank you. You know, like I said, I just, um, you know, Rhonda, I'm going to do my eye drops now. Thank you before we end here, because I'll, I'll forget to do them tonight because you're not here to remind me. But um I, I was in radio since 1979 and Doriented, I didn't just talk all the time. I played a lot of music, <clears throat> but I had to talk in between the records and um, I really didn't realize how much I missed it. So this is just, this is just fun for me. It really is. And sometimes I get done and I'm like, Oh God, I can't believe I said that or did that. But look at this. here. Look at him. He, the door is open. He can go outside and play. But he's just being dramatic. Oh, woe is me. Woe is me. Nobody. Nobody is playing with me. Woe is me. And babes out there meeting new friends. Jumping in the river doing Lord knows what. 
Let's see. <laughs> Joy says, it's Casey Anthony. Hey, Casey, give me a thumbs down. Join us in chat. Love to have you. Can you imagine? Oh, my God. Let's see here. Uh, you know, and that's the, that's the thing. The, one of the reasons I was very hesitant to do this type of show uh, was because of running Webs Loose. I've made, unfortunately, enemies, which I didn't want to make. But sometimes I have to ban people. Sometimes we have to, you know, have issues. And I hate it. I don't like it. And there was some real ugly contention that I'll tell you about one day that uh, changed who I was, made me a different person. And uh, had to do with a lot of people lying and almost killed me. But anyway, so I was worried because a lot of times I spend time dealing with problems on web sleuths and an angry person. And I was worried that all these angry people would show up and just start bitching at me here. And uh, that's why I'm so grateful. You guys are so kind. And this is this is better than therapy. I can't believe I, I took as long as I did to uh, to make this channel. But like I said, the new 10-minute uh, show, what we're going to do is we're going to bring websluice.com into YouTube and hopefully YouTube into websluice.com so we can all intermingle. And uh, y'all, if you're not, if you haven't joined websluice, you can see how, how much fun it is and how interesting and what a great community it is from all over the world. And let me stress again, I can go on WebSleuth at any time and look at the IP addresses. And there are so many law enforcement agencies from all over the world reading and reading. It's not like they jump on and jump off. They're there a lot. So they're looking at the ideas that the members are giving out, throwing out. You know, it's like... Um, I remember I described it this way one time in my former, thank you, God, former business partner got all mad and disgusted. But this is true. It's like everybody from all over the world got together and we're doing a giant spitballing session on a crime, throwing out our ideas, our thoughts, our uh, everything. And it's wonderful. And that's that's what loss, uh, uh, L.A. needs. Law enforcement needs, they need to look at the uh, other people who are who are looking at evidence. We don't have what they have. Oh, I've got great news. You know, last night, Cheryl McCollum was on, right? And she talked about the Atlanta copycat serial killer who had already killed three homeless people. And it was the exact type of crime that another serial killer was already in prison for. And um, here's what happened. Um, let me see here. Where is it? They, they've made an arrest. It's, it's the guy. And um, here's what she said. She said, CSI Atlanta. Now, CSI Atlanta um, is uh, something that Cheryl and uh, her, her partners do on an Atlanta news station. And she says, CSI Atlanta received a tip and sent it to APD homicide immediately. CSI Atlanta confirmed the arrest of David Lee for the murders of three homeless people uh, since June 1st. I've spoken to Sergeant Raymond Layton of the Atlanta Police Department, and he says Lee is in custody in Gwinnett County. Atlanta police did a tremendous job in tracking down and capturing this suspect, the suspected killer. Lee attended Morehouse and Tucker High School. He apparently, now get this, he apparently volunteered with Hands in Atlanta, which, as, uh, which is a homeless outreach program. So this guy volunteered. In fact, there's a picture of him on Cheryl's Facebook page. I'm going to put a link up here. And it shows him holding a certificate that says Hands on Atlanta. Let me put this... Uh, let me put this up in chat. So yes, it, uh, they caught him and you know, they had a great picture of him. They were able, Cheryl theorized that they were able 
to find the same guy at different uh, public transportation drop-offs that were the only public transportation <clears throat> you could use to get to where these homeless people were. And um, they got him. So, fantastic. I don't know who turned in the tip, but thank God somebody did. And hopefully this is the end of that nightmare in Atlanta. Let's not have any more copycats. I'll be interested to see if this guy, if this David Lee, I always want to say David Lee Roth because, you know, I played rock radio, but no, David Lee, if he knew of the other killer that's in prison, the, the original serial killer of homeless people, or did he know of him and just want to copy him? That's, it's going to be very interesting to see what happened here. Um, I don't know who this is. Is somebody calling me from Coral Springs? Hold on. Let me see. This might be somebody we want to talk to. Hold on. Barnes and Noble. Space Station. Yeah, figured it was a uh, one of those calls. So, anyway, let's see if I got any text messages. Okay, hang on. Yep. This guy, this David Lee, was a copycat killer who volunteered for the needy and the homeless. That's going to be a fascinating story. Oh, so Mary D. Someone popped up the other day while I was reading Gibbs's letter and complained. What did they say? I didn't see that. Sophie H., I was going to say something else, but it's a family show. I, I knew it was a, you know, your warranty is up. Or, ma'am, this is the IRS. We're coming to arrest you. Give us $1,000. So, one of those. You know what I've gotten into on YouTube? There are these guys that are these brilliant, like, computer dudes. And so they get these calls from these scammers, you know, that, hey, we want to pay you all this money, give you a refund, but then you've got to go buy us these, you know, uh, uh, gift cards and send them to us. a big scam. And this guy is such a computer genius. Gosh darn it, I can't remember who it is. But he is able, when they, these scammers, convince people to let them log into their bank account to supposedly make this deposit. Well, what they really do is take all the money out. And this guy has set it up so it looks like they are to, they are going to his bank account and it's all fake. But what he does, because he's this genius security dude, he's able to go into their computer and erase all their files. Oh, God, it's so much fun. It's scammer something. Anyway, I wish I had that link. I would put it right up here. Yeah, Microsoft, wanting to remote enter your computer. Phone scammers, that's it, Kim. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you just, just type in phone scammers. It is these guys, I mean, I admire them. There's a couple of them, a couple of uh, channels. Boy, they're smart. And they just, they they literally will spend all day on the phone with one scammer just to waste their time. And it's so great when they finally reveal who they are. But what's even better is when this one guy can get into the scammer's computer where they have all the phone numbers and all the information listed of who they need to call back and what they need to do, and he erases it all, and you just hear them melt down. God, it makes my day. Makes my day. A scammer payback channel. Thank you. Thank you, Reagan Jones. That's exactly it. Thank you, thank you. I, I'll put up a, um, yeah, me too. I'm so glad this guy is off the street. Uh, that's David Lee, the guy we were just talking about. Hold on one second here. Let me. I'm going to put up the YouTube uh, channel because it's worth watching.
Mm -hmm. No, no, that isn't. No, 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 no. Some stupid pain comes up. Where is it? Oh, no, I can't find it. Oh, here it is. Is that it? No. Dang it. I gotta find the exact one. Scammer, that's right, scammer payback, just like you said. I'm sorry, day. Yeah, hello. Oh my gosh, I don't want to. So, and he makes his voice sound like a little old lady. It is hilarious. You guys gotta watch this. You gotta subscribe to this. Because this, this man is doing great work for humanity. And sometimes he can get their IP addresses and tell them exactly where they're at, like what street they're on, and it freaks them out. I just love seeing bad people getting what's coming to them. That makes my day. Here's the, here it is. Thank you. Yes, never give your personal information over the phone. ABD, I will be doing afternoon shows Monday through Friday. Although, remember, I'm taking tonight off. I'm supposed to go to a birthday party. But I think I'll just sleep. I don't know. Yeah, Kim, that's all oh, you've, you've seen him. Yeah, he's gotten the victim's numbers and called them and warned them. And Yeah, you, oh, you're going to love it. You, you are going to love it. Mary D, you will love this guy. Vox, you're here. How are you, Vox? I don't think I said hello to you. Little Texan WS. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I am a lover. I really hate arguments. I really do. I just think there's always a way to get along. Unless you're trying to destroy me. Then I have a bit of an issue. Okay, I'm just going through here, making sure I got everybody. Oh, no, Mary D, no girl in cabin tonight. This is this. This is the, and normally this would be a quick uh, true crime update, but I kind of decided to do the night show today at two. It's Friday night. Hey, man, I'm, I'm rocking on a Friday. I mean... I'm out till 8.30 p.m. Yeah, it's wild. Remember the good old days when you didn't even start to get ready till 10 p.m.? You hit the clubs. You just thought those days would go on forever and ever and ever. Oh, that's right, Joyce. That's right. Today I am getting my... Um, I know, Mary D. I, I fool myself when I say it's going to be a 10-minute show. I just... Blah, 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 blah. Uh, today I do get my live mouse traps. I will be finding the family. Uh, I will be trapping them. I will take them to a good neighborhood with good schools. Their kids won't have any problems. There won't be any gangs and we will let them free. Then they can stop humiliating my cats. Last night, I swear to you, okay, Boo's weird and I have to put his dry food up on the little table thingy that I have the TV on. It's the only place he'll eat the dry food is in front of the TV on this thing and in this certain little bowl. I, I know, he's odd. Last night, I heard this kind of screeching. And so I grabbed my phone, turned on the flashlight, and the, the mouse is in Boo's food. Now, I'm thinking, okay, this is it. That Boo's going to do it. Nope. The mouse screeched and ran away. And Boo sat there and then he ate his food. I don't understand it. So anyway, live traps coming today. I'll put them out tonight. And tomorrow, they will go to a lovely 
Newfield, where all the good stores are, lots of clubs to join, lots of uh, community activity. I wouldn't put them in just any neighborhood. No. Okay. Oh, Kim, yeah. Um, she says, I saw the Stormtrooper suit online. I thought I'd get it for Kroger. You mean to like to go shopping? Oh, God, no. Uh, um, is it Huda or Judah in Calcutta? No, those sticky ones are beyond inhumane. I mean, literally, they're just, they, they lay there and starve. And if you try and peel them off and their feet come. Oh God, that's awful. No, I, I can't even kill them. These are live traps. So. Oh God, sensible crime. Exactly. The good old days when you could leave your house without a biohazard suit. That's the truth. <laughs> Oh, Mary D says, I went to the doctor today and there was a man trying to come in without a mask. Don't get it. Uh, and somebody asked, and I apologize, I didn't see who it was. Has anybody here had a, a mild uh, COVID infection? Uh, one of our members, Alexis R, did have COVID, but it made her very ill, very ill. Uh, th that's the problem. A lot of times, if you don't have any symptoms, there's no, you never know you had it. That's why you should wear a mask because... Then you don't spread it to other people. What a thought. And that's why other people should wear masks. Wherever I go, no one's wearing a mask with me. I I'm the only one. I even have one of those splash guard thingies that if I go into a big crowded store like a, a Kroger we Smith's here, I'll wear it. I don't care. I'll wear that and a mask. I don't care what people think. You know? They already think I'm nuts anyway. Just let them talk about me. Oh, just a bad penny says, I also saved a rat snake uh, from one of those sticky traps. Good. Yeah, those things are horrible. I don't know how, I don't know how a store can sell them. Oh my God, they're just awful. You know, and I understand killing mice, they, killing mice. They carry disease, you know, they get everywhere, they poop and pee everywhere and it's disgusting and I get it. But if you have to kill them, do it humanely for God's sakes. You know, I don't give them that horrible poison. I think that just the good old fashioned mousetrap breaking their neck, I think is the way to do it. But I can't do that. I just can't. My God, I hear that snap. And all I can think about is those little eyes looking at me going, hi, Trish. Where's the cheese and wine? I can't do it. I don't understand it. I do not understand it. Oh my God, Louise Davidson, me too. Louise says, I just discovered TikTok. Last night, I did too. My girlfriend sent me a video. She said, don't go there. Do not go to TikTok. You're going to get absolutely addicted. I'm like, yeah, right. That's exactly what I did. I couldn't stop watching. You know what makes me mad though? Those TikTok uh, videos that go, and now hit like for part two. And you do, and there's no part two. So if they say part two, I go on. That's my, I'm standing up by gosh and i'll make a difference on tiktok uh, my girlfriend wants me to do tiktok but i uh, i don't that there's i don't have anything interesting to do you know all these people doing great dances and telling great jokes and i'd be like scrappy joe let's go potty and tiktok video yeah five hours later exactly Rhonda Adams, this is an interesting comment. I used to have my inmates go and pick up all the grue strips and trash them. Humane way is better. Uh, Rhonda, that's very good. But when you say, I used to have my inmates, what exactly does that mean? Are you a guard? 
Do you foster inmates? Do you adopt inmates? Do you join inmates on trash pickup day for fun? <laughs> That's just like, what? You're inmates. I'm assuming you work in uh, the prison system at some sort. And I'm glad that you had them go pick up those uh, sticky traps. They are horrible. Yeah, TikTok rabbit hole. Oh my gosh. I, again, I was probably up for three hours last night watching 10 second TikTok videos. Is there like, is that the point? Is they have to be under a certain time? I, I don't know. I didn't read any rules or anything. I, you know, I saw, you know, profane grandma give a weather report. Um, there's a little, there's the thank you mama kid who is so adorable. I watched that like 12 times. It's this little toddler. Every time her mother, his mother gives him food. Thank you, mama. Thank you, mama. And that's all it is, but it's so damn cute. I can't stop watching it. I feel like I need to go to my shrink and say, what is wrong with me? So, oh, Rhonda Adams. I'm a retired correctional officer with the state of Florida. That explains it. And Rhonda, a correctional officer in the state of Florida. I bet you could write books. We should have you on as a guest because every time we read it, we know a man in, it's always Florida and it's always followed by, was naked, you know, put his foot up his own rectum. A man in Florida ate a tree. I mean, you, you just, it's crazy. I, I told you I, that I was, it was explained to me by somebody who said it's the heat. It's the heat in Texas and Florida that causes everybody to go crazy. Oh, little Texan. I can see how uh, kids would love TikTok. I, I, I do too. I, I can't get enough. Who are these people? And I look at them and they have like normal houses. Like they have good kitchens and stoves and sinks that have a faucet and it's like a fantasy, fantasy world of mine. <laughs> Granny Sue, profane grandma. I wonder if that's my sister. It could be. I know, Kim, I've got to stop. I've got to stop with TikTok. Because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, when I'm done here... Got to do a few things and I'll just watch TikTok for just a minute or 12 hours. No, I've got too much to do. Yes, Rhonda Adams. And I bet you have some amazing stories to tell. So, okay, gang. I'm going to do my eye drops because I need to get things done. I am getting a lot of people verified or at least setting it up today on WebSleuths. We've been, I've been very derelict in, in getting that done. It's just been overwhelming, but I'm getting a handle on it. So it's one of the great things about WebSleuths. If somebody comes on and says, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, or, you know, I know this person or I knew the victim, we immediately tell them, you're welcome to post. However, if you're going to post something based on who you say you are, you need to verify who you are. I'm the only one that knows their real name and I can you know, see their license if they're a lawyer or doctor or whatever. I verify people if they know people in cases and things like that. And then under their username, it says they're verified as whatever. And that way, you know, when they say something about a particular uh, case, you know, they have an expertise, an expertise that has been verified short of hiring a private detective. Yeah, We had to do that. I think I told you about the uh, detective, homicide detective, who was the most popular person on Web Sleuths way long ago. Everybody waited for this detective to post. Couldn't wait. Finally, I realized it was weird that this detective spent all their time on Web Sleuths posting details about homicide cases that they claimed they were working on. And I thought, oh my gosh, you're going to get in trouble. And I said, I better talk to your boss. I don't want to, you to get in trouble. Plus, somebody had already given me a heads up, I think, that said, this person isn't who they say they are. Fine. Come to find out, they were a 
part-time jailer. Nothing to do with homicide. Made it all up. For, I mean, I'm going to say for at least a year. Yeah, so that's why we started the verification process. And, and that's the thing on WebSUS. Every rule is for a reason because something happened. that We had to create this rule. So, okay, I am. Oh, thank you, Ron Adams. Thank you. Uh, Kim, I will, not tomorrow, I'll be just tomorrow night. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, I'm not going to do the update. I don't think. Maybe I will. But definitely Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern. But here goes the glaucoma drops. I do not feel like I have glaucoma, but my doctors say I do. And unless I do these drops with you guys, I forget. There we go. And the side effect is it makes my lashes longer. Yay. So, okay. My darling true crime angels, thank you very much for your support in chat, for your financial support, for being here, for showing up and making my life great. Thank you, moderators, and we'll see you all on websleuths.com. See you tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Pacific for Websleuths YouTube Live. Okay? Love you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.